In the words of a rocket to the moon, even though she moves so well, I don't need a girl like Annabelle. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the Lore Launch. You may be familiar with the Annabelle doll from movies like The Conjuring, The Conjuring 2, Annabelle, Annabelle Creation, and Annabelle Comes Home, all made by like the same set of three directors. It's really quite wild. I will say The Conjuring is one of my favorite movies, and I also will say that before this, I did one of my Twitch streams, and I am mildly sauced because they kind of make me drink on those. Anyway, the point being, we're gonna talk about a haunted doll today. So, for those of you who don't know, who aren't like familiar with me in real life, I am terrified of porcelain dolls. And also American Girl dolls, to be perfectly honest. I don't like dolls. Um, I've always had a severe amount of discomfort with them. One time when I was house-sitting for my aunt, I had to stay in my cousin's room, and Katie, for some reason, had like 18 American Girl dolls. It was horrible. I slept on the couch the entire room. Thank you, Katie. But anyway, it seems my fears may have been founded because the Annabelle doll has a lot of stories regarding almost killing or definitely killing several people. Now, to get started with the story, we really do have to go to the beginning because the Annabelle doll has a bit of a reputation from Hollywood that doesn't match the actual events that transpired with the doll itself. For example, in the Conjuring movies and the Annabelle movies that are related to it, the doll is a porcelain doll, and it is about yay big, it's about the, the size of a small toddler, and it is not the correct doll. Now, initially, the real Annabelle doll, the one that is housed in the Warrens Museum in Connecticut, which is now closed after both Ed and Lorraine Warren died, it's now run by another guy. I watched one of his YouTube videos earlier. He needs some help with his like whole plot thing, and maybe also everything else. But the point of the matter is, the Annabelle doll itself is a Raggedy Ann doll. If you don't know what a Raggedy Ann doll is, it's right here. So, not the scariest thing, but uh, still deeply unsettling when you know the context. So, the original Annabelle doll was gifted to a woman named Donna, and her last name is not available anywhere on the planet, but honestly, I find it really hilarious to imagine that this is Momlennial, so we're gonna go with that assumption this entire time, even though she's only a few years too young. Love you, Donna. I'm glad you're banned from TikTok. But anyway, the real Donna involved with the Annabelle doll was useful to society as she was a nurse and she lived with another nurse named Angie and Angie had a boyfriend named Lou. All three of these people play major roles in this story because the doll itself was gifted to Donna by her mother on her 28th birthday in the year 1970. Now, a very important thing to note is that the specific model of Annabelle doll, the specific, sorry, Raggedy Ann doll, the specific Raggedy Ann doll was new in 1970. So there's no way that the Conjuring movies and the Annabelle movies, which present this doll as having a history, is actually true. This doll was most likely purchased new in 1970 as a gift. Now, while the doll was initially harmless, over time it started to take on several properties. For example, it would move around the house. Donna would leave the doll on a couch, and then she would come home from work, and the doll would be in the bedroom with the door closed. Now, Angie worked similar shifts to Donna, and Lou was not in the house that often. Sorry, the, the apartment that they lived in. Point is, nobody was home to move the doll. Now, eventually, Things got a little bit worse, and I need to make it clear because all of the sources on this that you will read on the internet do not do a very good job of giving you the time scale here. It began with a doll that was completely inert, and over the course of a year, it got to the point where one day, when Lou was home alone at the apartment taking a nap on the couch, he had a bit of a sleep paralysis episode. Sleep paralysis episode. He woke up and found that Annabelle was crawling up his leg, which in some circumstances might be sensual, but in this case it was absolutely not, because it was a raggedy Ann doll. After the sleep paralysis episode, there, there was nothing that really happened, uh, aside from the doll allegedly strangling Lou to the point where he blacked out. But aside from that, nothing else really happened. So Lou decided at this point he really did not like this doll. He started trying to convince Don to get rid of it because it was terrible. It was not doing anything good for anybody in the household. They didn't like it and it also tried to kill him, which is honestly, you know, try saying, you know, we should get rid of this doll is a very reasonable response to a circumstance like that. But 
he would have one more encounter that would lead to the escalation in this story. Because one day, Lou was at the apartment, hanging out, and he heard a rustling coming from Donna's bedroom. Now, worried that there was a burglar, he decided he was going to go check it out. So, he walked into Donna's bedroom and found absolutely nothing, no signs of forced entry, just the doll laying face down in the corner. Upon seeing the doll, he began to feel some sort of presence behind him. And next thing he knew, he felt a searing pain in his chest as if daggers were being dragged across his pectoralis majors. Now, according to Lou, these wounds healed over the course of two days. They were almost completely gone the first day, and they were completely healed the second day. Nonetheless, they decided that this was an appropriate time to call a psychic medium, which I must stress to everybody watching this video, no matter how many times you think contacting a psychic medium is a good idea, it will never be a good idea because the majority of them are scammers and the ones that aren't probably don't understand demonology as well as you would like them to. And I say that because the very first thing that this psychic decided to do was hold a seance. And the thing is, in typical lore with ghosts, ghosts are fragments of a person's soul. It's something that is left behind after you die due to trauma, or a, another intense emotion, whether it be love or grief or anger, it doesn't really matter. The point here is ghosts are not sentient. They will repeat whatever happened to them in life. So they won't lie to you. Demons, on the other hand, love to lie to you. And that is precisely what happened in this case. Because when that seance was held, the spirit, so to speak, that was inhabiting the Annabelle doll told everybody that it was the ghost of Annabelle Higgins, a seven-year-old girl who had died on the property that once stood where their apartment complex now was. She was supposedly found lifeless in a field for some reason. Nothing else is really elaborated upon. Initially, the spirit of Annabelle told Donna, Angie, Lou, and the psychic that she was harmless and she was just sad and lonely. And the girls decided that, you know what? They were gonna give this child a chance. They were gonna nurture it. They were gonna give it attention, which when you think about it, these are all the worst possible things you could do in the case of a demonic possession, but they did them anyway. And over the course of the next couple of months, a large number of rather unfortunate events unfolded. The problem here is the Warrens don't tell us what those events were. We just know that things got worse, and eventually Donna and Angie and Lou decided it was the right course of action to contact a priest. This was Father Hegan, and he was an Episcopalian priest, specifically. Now, something you need to understand, and if you check out earlier videos on our channel, we have an episode of our podcast where we have a priest on, Father Peter. And he tells us quite a bit about how exorcisms work outside of the Catholic Church. He's an Orthodox priest. Orthodox and Episcopalian priests perform exorcisms in much the same way. They're not really trained exorcists. They more go and use the power of the Holy Spirit to banish demons from the home. Catholics, on the other hand, have trained exorcists. And it's not a elective position where you decide, I want to be an exorcist. No. They pick per particularly strong candidates to become exorcists and they train them by selection. It is not a process of you applying to be an exorcist. It is you are noted for your abilities and your strength and your faith and you are handpicked to receive exorcist training. And they have a number of these throughout each diocese so that they can adapt as needed. In this case, they called Episcopalian. Father Hegan felt that this was outside of his realm of strength, so he elevated it to Father Cook, a higher-ranking priest within his diocese. Father Cook decided that he didn't quite know what was going on and contacted a very well-known couple who did demonology research, the Warren family. The initial diagnosis of Ed and Lorraine Warren was that what was being dealt with here was not the ghost of some child who had passed away. Rather, it was a demonic entity that had infested the area and was seeking to possess either Donna, Angie, or Lou. 
Now, in order to do this, the Warrens claimed that the demon or entity or spirit, as they refer to it, needed permission, which is exactly what they got when the seance occurred. Because during the course of the seance, Donna and Angie felt bad for Annabelle, and they welcomed her into their home, which is like the worst thing you can do when it comes to paranormal entities, whether it is a ghost, a vampire, a werewolf, a demon, it doesn't really matter. The point is, you never welcome these things into your home. It could be one of the fey folk. You don't do that, because it just gives them strength. And not only did they give it strength, they gave it attention, they nurtured it. And over time, it grew worse and worse and worse. And when the Warrens got there, they claimed that if there were two or three more weeks before they had been contacted, the demon probably would have killed everybody in the home. Now, one often untouched piece of information around this is the act of Annabelle leaving notes on parchment paper all around the apartment. This is relevant because parchment paper is not simply printer paper. Parchment itself is animal skin. Parchment paper is typically a term referred that is used to refer to uh, wax paper used for baking. Donna did not keep parchment paper in the house. So in order for parchment paper to materialize, somebody either had to bring it in or the demon had to go ahead and place it there. I want to be very clear that there are so many loose ends with this story that it is entirely possible that someone was screwing around and leaving parchment paper everywhere to screw with Donna. I don't want to make this sound like I totally believe the Warrens, because to be honest, I don't. But much to the positive note of things, uh, the Warrens were able to convince Donna that there was a demonic entity or an evil spirit, as they refer to it, infesting her home, and that if the doll was not removed immediately, despite the fact that a demon cannot possess a doll, in their own words, by the way, a demon cannot possess an inanimate object, they were able to convince her to have an exorcism performed. They called Father Cook. He came and reluctantly performed the exorcism in every room of the apartment. The Warrens took the doll with them. And here's where things go wildly out of hand to the extent that I almost believe from this story alone that the Warrens were completely full of it. They claim that the doll was there for the entire exorcism process, and afterwards, they took the doll, put it in their car, put it in the back seat, and decided that they were going to drive home. Also, if you just heard a slight growl, it was not a demon, it was Archie, he's hanging out, and he's apparently decided that he has not received enough attention this evening. So upon taking the doll, they placed it into the back seat of their car and drove home. They decided not to take the interstate just in case the doll decided to interfere. And according to them, interfere it did. Because they mentioned that every single turn, the car would swerve. They had difficulty keeping control. The brakes failed. The acceleration failed the wrong times. And miraculously, they did make it home because Ed turned around and splashed holy water all over the doll. I would like to, at this point in the video, point out that if an exorcism had properly been performed, there would be no demon attached to the doll. Also, Ed claimed that demons don't attach themselves to inanimate objects, so why would the demon even be following him in the first place? It doesn't make any sense. But then again, when does everything ever make sense from the 1970s? But as far as their claim that the doll or the demon manipulating the doll, used the medium, basically moved the doll, the, the, the argument was that the demon moved the doll around the house in order to draw attention to it, at which point Lou, paying attention to the doll, got involved with it, and the scratches along his chest were used as pretense to call a seance with a medium, and the demon used this seance to grant itself permission via Donna to inhabit the house. Now, that all tracks, to be perfectly honest. What doesn't track is the demon, after being exorcised, following the Warrens' home back to their museum and house. Now, there are several stories that stem from this. For example, a father, Jason Bradford, supposedly took the doll, held it, looked at it, threw it on a chair, and said, Annabelle, you're just a doll. You can't hurt anybody. And then on his way home from the Warrens' house, he claims that he got into a car accident after seeing Annabelle appear in his rearview mirror. Again, not really how demonology works, 
at all because the doll should have been detached from the demon in the first place after they left the other house. But also, why would it follow him if he didn't have the doll in his possession? And if it did follow him, how would it get back to the Warren's house? None of it really makes any sense whatsoever, but it's fine. Ed Warren also claimed that upon bringing the doll home, he inspected it and he would watch it as it levitated. But under no circumstances was it ever reported that Donna, Lou, or Angie saw the doll actually move. The doll would move while they weren't there. So Ed's story doesn't totally hold up in my opinion in this case. Now, later on, several years later, perhaps even 20 years later, based on the story itself, a couple went to the Warrens Museum and allegedly the boyfriend of the two knocked on the glass and joked about how Annabelle was just a doll and this was so stupid and it couldn't possibly hurt anybody. And then on their way home, his motorcycle lost control and crashed into a tree, killing him instantly and nearly killing his girlfriend, who, according to the Warrens, was hospitalized for an entire year. And then the girlfriend, upon leaving the hospital, claimed that she and her boyfriend had been laughing about the Annabelle doll right before the accident happened. This is the final story that I could find from any reliable source involving the Annabelle doll. Now... Part of the issue here is that in 1965, a Twilight Zone episode called The Living Doll came out. The Living Doll episode was about a doll that did essentially everything Annabelle did. It caused car crashes, it caused scratches, it moved around the house, did all of these things. And the mother's name in that episode, the, the mother of the family, was Annabelle. Now, in the early 1900s, there was another story that came about of another doll that supposedly moved around the house and caused mischief. This doll's name was Robert, and it was in Key West, Florida. It seems to have almost exactly the same characteristics as the Annabelle doll. So, between Robert the doll and the Twilight Zone episode in which a mother named Annabelle has a living doll, I have to wonder, did the Warrens see an opportunity to invent... Annabelle? It seems possible, considering none of their stories can actually be corroborated, and their demonology doesn't line up. A demon would not attach itself to the doll after an exorcism, so either Father Cook's exorcism was completely ineffective, or they made it up. I can't say which is the truth, but I will say this. Earlier tonight, I watched a video of the Annabelle doll being moved. The real Annabelle doll, in the Warren's Museum, by the curators of the Warren... Museum of the Paranormal. I can't remember exactly what it's called. The point is, at no point did anybody in that video express any real concern. Their blessing, their exorcism, was half-hearted. And if you speak to any priest, they will tell you that an exorcism is not simply saying words. It's not reading Latin off a page. An exorcism is a spiritual battle between the priest using the power of the Holy Spirit, channeling it through him, and the demon itself. That is not the, for lack of a better word, vibe of any of these videos that involve the doll. It all seems very nonchalant and unimpressive. Which leads me to believe one of two things. Either the people who are in charge of the Annabelle doll do not take it seriously and are not aware of the danger they're in, or they know that it's bullshit. Now, none of this video is to discount the existence of spirits, ghosts, demons, any of that. The point here is that the Annabelle doll specifically cannot be corroborated. There are no last names involved, so nobody can actually be looked up. The only last name involved is Annabelle Higgins, and on a cursory search, I will admit this was not in-depth, I could not verify the existence of an Annabelle Higgins anywhere in New England. Now, again, it's totally possible that there was one and I just failed to locate her, but I, I lean towards the belief that there was never an Annabelle Higgins and that the Warrens may have fabricated this entire story. But at the same time, I'm sometimes wrong. It happens. So if you have other information, please let me know at thelorelogicgmail.com. I will get back to you at some point, hopefully soon, but I do miss sometimes. Archie, I understand. You're, you're excited. You're excited about the coffee. Because Archie loves coffee, or at least the smell of coffee. I don't give my dog coffee. That would be extremely irresponsible. The point here being, we have coffee now.
And if you want to buy it, the link is in the description. It's from Tableau Roasting Co. I personally curated it, and that matters because I was a barista for a very long time. My father owned a coffee shop. My father and my mother met in a coffee shop. I am essentially the product of coffee. So if you want a very, very good coffee blend, check out our coffee roast at tableauroastingco.com. The link is in the description. You can support us by subscribing to our Patreon for as little as $1 a month and you can become a YouTube member, or you can check out the plethora of links or our Amazon store where I have curated a selection of whiskey glasses, coffee mugs, totes, books, movies, and other such things. All of these links are in the description, and most importantly, they are all centralized on my link tree. So if you check that out in the description again, notice how many times I've said description, you should really check out the description. Also smash the like button, share this video, subscribe if you're feeling about it. If you're not, we understand. Sometimes this, I'm um, not everybody's cup of tea. Um, sometimes I'm your cup of coffee. Remember, Tableau Roasting Co. Point being, check us out, help us out, and we will be back with more videos for you next week. I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by the world. And next thing he knew, he felt a searing pain in his chest as if daggers were being raked across his breasticles. I probably shouldn't say that. And next thing he knew, he felt a searing pain in his chest as if daggers were being dragged across his pectoralis majors. We're gonna keep that one. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Cause honestly, I don't remember enough of what I was saying. It's fair. This is like a free episode of Drunk Folklore.